Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in this morning. My regular listeners will be anticipating the follow uh, the uh, continuing of our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power, by R. W. Thompson. Yesterday we talked about this unholy alliance between the Pope of Rome and the French King uh, Pepin. Uh, the French king attempting to overthrow the legitimate government of France, uh, King Clovis, and the papacy using the French king to relieve itself of the legitimate government of Constantinople. And what we're reading about here in history is the fulfillment of the rise of the little horn of Daniel and the restrainer who is taken out of the way. The legitimate government of Constantinople, the emperor taken out of the way and leaving a power vacuum in Rome, and the rise of that little horn, the pope, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Now, backing up a little bit for continuity purposes in the, in the final sentences on page 326, if you're following along in your book, Whatever the precise facts may have been, the question lay between the Roman people, in whose name the Pope acted, and the Emperor, to whom, as subjects, they owed allegiance by the existing laws of nations. The Pope, as a subject, also owed his allegiance no less than the people. His power was exclusively ecclesiastical and possessing none over temporal or political matters, whatsoever he did in reference to these, he did necessarily as a subject. So the Pope was no less a subject to the Emperor of Constantinople than were the people of Rome. And the Pope was simply attempting to overthrow the authority of Constantine and his successors and to set up his own kingdom in the West. And Pepin, likewise, seeking to overthrow the legitimate government of France, King Clovis, the Merovingian king, to install his own line of uh, successors, the Carlovingians. And since both were in a treasonous state, they aided one another. They aided one another. An, un an unholy alliance between the king of the uh, the pretended king of France, the de facto rather king of France, Pepin, and likewise de facto the Pope of Rome. And he said he could not. That meaning the Pope could not get rid of the obligation of his allegiance by any act short of revolt against the legitimate authority that is, Constantinople. And this relation in which he and the Roman people stood to the emperors must be kept in mind in order to understand the full bearing of the subsequent events out of which the temporal power of the Pope arose. Dr. Fredit, and we've talked about him before, uh, an historian, Dr. Fredit, referring to the condition into which the people were thrown by the neglect of the emperors, also says, quote, In this extremity, the Romans embraced the last resource which was left them, that of calling the valiant monarch of the French to their assistance, unquote. And upon the same subject, he says at another place, quote, Thus finding implacable enemies both in the barbarians, that is, the Lombards, and in their own sovereigns, the people, driven almost to despair, began to sigh ardently for a new and better order of things. The eyes of all were turned toward the Pope as their only refuge and the common father of all in distress. In this state of desolation, the sovereign pontiffs, unable any longer to resist the eagerness of the multitudes flying into their arms for protection and refuge, and destitute of every other means applied to the French, who alone were both willing and able to defend them against the Lombards. Unquote. 
This statement presents, it is believed, the papal view in the most satisfactory light. And I'll just add that Fredit is very friendly to the papacy. He's a Catholic historian. And it says, and yet the reader cannot fail to observe how distinctly it asserts the revolutionary right of the Roman people under the guidance of the Pope to throw off their allegiance to their lawful sovereigns, the successors of Constantine. And the resort to this remedy is both excused and justified in the absence of any accusation of misgovernment or oppression against the emperors. They are charged with not having been sufficiently prompt and energetic in defending Rome against the threatened attack of the Lombards, yet with having been guilty of yet not with having been guilty of any wrong or injustice toward either the Roman people or the Pope. So this can be called nothing but a, a, a bald-faced rebellion. Okay, an unjust rebellion of the Pope and the people against the legitimate government of Constantinople. No legitimate claim can be brought against the empire for mismanagement, misgovernment. And it says, modern revolutions have been inaugurated as the last and ultimate remedy for grievances which can be endured no longer without an abandonment of all natural rights. And yet, it is against these that the fiercest anathemas of the papacy have been launched. See the hypocrisy? The Pope rose to power as the result of an illegitimate revolution against the, the, the rightful, benevolent government of Constantinople. And yet the Pope has made a history of condemning similar revolutions around the world. As the moral and temporal judge of all the earth, the Pope stands alone to criticize any other attempt to overthrow legitimate governments. And it says here, however, the Pope is justified for having put the temporal affairs of Rome in the keeping of the French king for the twofold purpose of defending them against the Lombards and of acquiring the temporal power himself. There you go, to acquire temporal power for himself at a time when the Roman people were not suffering any oppression from the empire. Rome, for several centuries before that time, had acquired no distinct existence as a nation. As Dr. Fred had agrees, it belonged to the temporal possessions of the eastern emperors. They had never abandoned their claim to it and had never expressed a willingness to do so. Hence, the right of the Romans to act independently of the emperors in order, to, uh, in order ultimately to resist their authority was purely revolutionary and cannot be justified even in the modern view unless it was necess a necessary measure of relief against severe and irremediable oppression. How such a right can be defended at all, consistently with the expressed opinions of, of the present Pope, that is, Pope Pius IX, and his defenders, it is difficult to understand. Can it be that they regard revolution as justifiable only when it inures the benefit of the papacy? Let me ask the question again. Can it be that they regard revolution as justifiable only when it inures, the, uh, inures to the benefit of the papacy? Well, let me just tell my listeners, that is how the Pope views it. Any revolution in the world is justified to overthrow a de facto government. Now, let me just define de facto and de jure for you. In the Pope's definition... A government that overthrows a legitimate, papally assigned government and actually takes control of the nation successfully becomes and factually becomes the government, uh, the rebellious government, is called a de facto government. In other words, a government in fact. 
They are definitely in control of the nations, but they don't have the blessings of the Pope. All right. A de jure government, according to the papacy, is a government established by the papacy, a government that is friendly to the papal cause, a government that accepts the supreme authority of the Pope. That is a de jure government. So when you're watching Fox News or CNN or any of the other mainstream media sources reporting about de facto and de jure governments, now you know what they're talking about. A de facto government is a, is a government against which the Pope is fighting. It has taken over a legitimate government established by the Pope. A de jure government is a government established by the Pope. All right, now this is what we're talking about. It said the Eastern emperors at the time referred to were at war with the Arabs, a fierce and formidable enemy. The fact of having to carry on such a war as this may, in some degree, account for the alleged neglect of the Roman people. But besides this, it is also true that the controversy between the Western and the Eastern Christians in reference to the worship of images had much to do in fixing the relations between them, especially those between the emperors and the popes. Remember, the, the Eastern and Western churches were fighting over whether or not to bow down and worship images and idols in the church. It's called the War of the Iconoclasts. You can look up iconoclast, <clears throat> iconoclastic in uh, Wikipedia or any other encyclopedia and learn what that was all, all about. But these so-called Catholic Christians, the Eastern Orthodox that had its center of power in Constantinople, and the Romans were at war over this question about uh, the veneration of images and idols in the church. So there was a division that existed, and it simply took on the flavor of an excuse to justify this rebellion of the Pope against the legitimate government, the de jure government of Constantinople. Now, the author continues, it is most probable and plausible view of the matter to say that on account of this purely religious disagreement and the violence to which it led on both sides, the Pope was very ready to avail himself of the existing condition of affairs to throw himself under the royal protection of King Pepin and thus build up a powerful monarchy in the West under the shelter of which he could consummate his contemplated revolt against the emperors. In the light of subsequent events, this is the most natural conclusion and several contemporaneous facts contribute to its, to its support. When the Pope invoked the aid of the Emperor and later instructed him to go to the court of Astolphus, the Lombard, excuse me, when the Pope invoked the aid of the Emperor, the latter, that is, the Emperor, instructed the Pope to go to the court of Astolphus, the Lombard king, and to demand the restoration of Ravenna and the other cities he had seized, in the name of the empire, showing thereby that he had no idea of abandoning his authority and jurisdiction over any part of Italy. This imperial order was ordered by Stephen the Third, who was then Pope, by visiting the court of the Lombard king and making the demand in the name of the emperor and as his ambassador. It was, however, refused by Astolphus who had no idea of willingly surrendering the advantages he had acquired by the possession of Ravenna and the other cities. The Pope not only expected this, but had prepared for it by taking other steps independently of the Emperor. He had taken other steps independently of the Emperor. In other words, he's acting alone. He first claims to be the ambassador of the Emperor, and now he's acting independently of the emperor and without his knowledge, says R.W. Thompson. These exercise a controlling influence in deciding upon his motives. He had already addressed himself to Pepin and had also written to uh, French dukes, quote, beseeching them to come to the rescue of St. Peter, unquote, <clears throat> 
and promising, and promising them, says Cormenin, quote, in the name of the apostle, the remission of all the sins they had committed or might commit in the future, and guaranteeing to them unalterable happiness in this world and eternal life in the next, unquote. And there, for my Catholic critic, is proof in history that the popes forgave sins of the future in order for uh, to acquire help in propping up this pope. This is called an indulgence. This is called simony in the Bible. This idea that the pope can forgive any sins, he can't even forgive his own sins, let alone anyone else's. But here this arrogant, blasphemous pretension called the papacy sets itself up as the judge of all the world and can give absolution and penance and hear confessions and forgive sins. It's all a lie. It's all blasphemy. Because this is the, indeed the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn of Daniel. Now, he guaranteed to the French, anybody that came to the rescue of the papacy, forgiveness of sins, both past sins and future sins, and guaranteed them happiness in this life and eternal bliss in the, in the life hereafter. And it said he, may, he also made up his mind before he set out for Pavia, where the Lombard king held his court, that he would go directly to France and hold a personal interview with Pepin for the better explanation and understanding of his alliance with Pope Zachary and of their mutual relations in consequence of it. From these facts, it is perfectly apparent that he had deliberated upon his revolt against the empire and plotted the means of carrying it out before he left Rome. That he was guilty of both duplicity and perfidy is beyond all question. For while acting as the official ambassador of his sovereign, he was at the same time engaged in making a hostile treaty with a foreign monarch. He was not deterred by the consideration of any misfortune which might befall the empire. After the refusal of Astolphus, he hastened on to France and negotiated another alliance with Pepin without reporting his failure to the emperor. He had set out upon this, his revolt with, result, uh, with resolute steps and conscious of the strength of the military power he was invoking cast his eyes no longer toward Constantinople, except with a view to plan more successfully the measures by which he hoped to us, which he hoped to sunder his alliance to the empire. By the laws of nations, as they now exist, this would be treason. But however it may have been then considered, the Pope doubtless sought for his justification in the fact that Constantine Copronymus was an iconoclastic emperor, and Pepin was a faithful son of the Roman Church and the head of a monarchy which, quote, founded by the priests, was true to the priests, unquote. It was the most natural thing in the world for him to conclude that as the papacy had been the means of enabling Pepe, uh, Pepin to make his own revolt against King Childeric III successful, Pepin would reciprocate the favor by helping him break off his alliance to the eastern emperors. Such combinations among ambitious and aspiring men have been frequent in the world, yet history gives no account of any other that has been followed by so long a train of consequences. And those consequences of this unholy alliance between King Pepin and, and the Pope live on today. The world still is affected by the results of this unholy alliance. And that's an understatement. Now, Pepin, no doubt anticipating advantages to himself, 
readily consented to comply with the request of the Pope. He marched his army against the Lombard king and compelled him to surrender up all the territory occupied by him. And he at this point, and here at this point, we see the advantages which the papacy achieved in the alliance. For Pepin, entirely ignoring the claim of the empire, caused the territory to be surrendered to the Pope in the name of the See of Rome. And the Pope accepted the royal present with as little compunction of conscience as if he were a subject of the King of France instead of the Empire of the East. The territory thus surrendered included Ravenna, Bologna, Ferrara, and Pentapolis, all of which, it is said by the papal writers, was conveyed by a quote-unquote solemn grant in order that Rome, with these territories as appended to it, should be erected into an ecclesia <coughs> excuse me, should be erected into an ecclesiastical state with the temporal power to govern it in the hands of the Pope. Now here we have here we have the historical evidence showing how the Pope transitioned from a mere ecclesiastic from a mere bishop of a local church in Rome to a temporal king. Now he's not just a priest, but he's a king as well. You know, before he could very hardly uh, counterfeit Christ because he had no kingdom. So he could hardly be called Antichrist. He could hardly be called the counterfeit of Christ. He was just a priest. But now, he's a priest and a king. Just like Jesus, right? This is, this is the rise of Antichrist we're talking about. And he says, this, it should be observed, was the year 754 A.D., seven and a half centuries after the commencement of the Christian era, and constitutes the only basis of the papal claim to temporal power which has the slightest plausibility about it or is in any sense defensible. Without stopping now, let me ask you a question while we're on this subject. <clears throat> Here it is, 754 A.D. Now, you would think that if God had established the papacy to be the vicegerent of Christ, the vicar of Christ on earth, and that he was to be both a priest and a king, that he wouldn't wait seven and a half centuries after the crucifixion of Christ to make him so, would it? No, more evidence to prove that the papacy's kingship, at the very least, the papacy's kingship, his temporal power, is a human invention. Satan's attempt, to use the papacy as an agency, a human living agency, through which to fulfill his five-point false prophecy in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. Satan, the false prophet, uses the papacy to attempt to fulfill in the world his false prophecy of elevating himself to be like the Most High. Is it starting to make sense? It certainly makes sense to me, and it obviously makes sense to R.W. Thompson. Pepin took back the territories seized by the Lombards and gave it to the Pope. He didn't give it back to the Emperor. He gave it to the Pope. That made him a traitor, a treasonous traitor of the legitimate government of uh, Constantinople. So he stands duly charged. And the Pope accepted this extortion and became a temporal king. He also is a traitor to the legitimate government of Constantinople and now rises and fulfills his prophetic role as priest and king, counterfeit priest and king, calling itself Christianity. But the temporal power of the Pope is built on a fraud. The temporal power of the Pope is built on, a, on an unlawful revolution. 
In fact, the papacy and its temporal power included is a de jure, is a de facto government. By definition, a de facto government. It has no legitimacy in the world at all. It says they erected out of Pepin, out of this seizure of the, this land possessed by the Lombards, out of this territory he erected it into an ecclesiastical state with the temporal power to govern it in the hands of the Pope. The Pope has become not just a priest but a king, and he says this, it should be observed, was the year 754 A.D., seven and a half centuries after the commencement of the Christian era, making it obvious in any unbiased mind that the papacy is a human institution and not a divine institution. Why would the creator of all heaven and earth, after sacrificing his life on the cross for the redemption of, the, of mankind, leave himself a human vicar on the earth and then deprive him of his kingdom for seven and a half centuries? It makes no sense. No common sense. It's a lie. And the, the author continues. Here it is, the year 754, seven and a half centuries after the commencement of the Christian era, and it constitutes the only basis of the papal claim to temporal power, which has the slightest plausibility, and I call it no plausibility, which has the slightest plausibility about it or is in any sense defensible. Without stopping now to inquire why, if this power were absolutely necessary to Christianity and the Church, it was so long permitted by Providence, capital P, meaning Christ, to be deferred seven and a half centuries there are several questions arising out of the foregoing circumstances too important to be passed by. Was there any such grant as is alleged to have been made by Pepin, conferring title to the surrendered territory upon the Pope? One would suppose, if there had been, that it would have been produced before now in order to settle the many controversies that have, been, that have taken place on the subject. Its existence has been frequently denied, and its exhibition has been invited and challenged in a variety of ways. The limits of the grant have been often controverted, some popes endeavoring to enlarge and others to contract them. An inspection of it at any time would have settled all these questions. But although it has been said that it is preserved in the Vatican at Rome, it has never yet been produced. Fontanini, in his defense of the jurisdiction of the Pope, quote, intimates that this grant is yet extant, and even makes use of some phrases that are said to be contained in it, unquote. But, as is well remarked by McLean, this, quote, will scarcely be believed. Were it indeed true that such a deed remains, it being published to the world would undoubtedly un, would uh, would undoubtedly be unfavorable to the pretensions the pretensions of Rome. Unquote. He refers also to the fact that in a dispute between the Emperor Josephus I and the Pope concerning Camaccio, the partisans of the latter constantly refused to exhibit the deed and also to the further fact that Bacchiani, uh, ba, uh, Bian, uh, Bianchini had given a specimen of it, quote, from a Farnesian manuscript, which seems to carry the marks of a, re, of a remote antiquity, unquote, and then says, quote, be this as it may, a multitude of witnesses unite in assuring us that the, re, that the remorse of a wounded conscience was the source of Pepin's liberality, in other words, this deed or this grant. And this grant to the, papal pont uh, the Roman pontiff was the su 
superstitious remedy by which he hoped to expiate his enormities and particularly his horrid perfidy to his legitimate master, Childeric, unquote. So they're asserting to support their, their, their defense of this fictitious deed or this fictitious grant to the Pope of this territory that Pepin's motive in handing over this territory to the Pope was, as it were, uh, reparation, a, 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 an act of penance, because his conscience bothered him, because he overthrew the, the legitimate government of Childeric and other unmentionable sins, and the Pope accepted this grant, and it is said to be on paper kept safely tucked away at the Vatican and has never been brought out for observation. Now, the author continues, he says, It is a rule of law that when a party pretends to have in his possession evidence that would explain any manner of controversy in which he is involved, the fact of his withholding it should be construed unfavorably to his pretensions. Therefore, as more than 1,100 years have elapsed since the conquest of Pepin from the Lombards, and during all this time no quote-unquote grant from him to the Pope has ever been produced, it is not unreasonable to conclude that none such ever was made. And yet it is true, doubtless, that Pepin did put the Pope in possession of the conquered territory. In other words, the Pope did indeed become the de facto government of this, this territory in question. He did become the temporal prince of that territory and still exercises authority not only over it, but uses it as a justification to be the temporal ruler of every land in the world. That is the new world order. And he, he, he pretends that this is the creation of his God-given temporal rights. And it says, And yet it is true, doubtless, that Pepin did put the Pope in possession of the conquered territory and confer upon him, as far as he could, the authority to govern it, that is, as a temporal prince, as the head of the Roman Catholic Church, but without any attempt to convey it by deed. Okay, so they're contradicting themselves. There is no deed, but it is a fact. The Pope rules. He's a de facto government. <laughs> I wonder how the Pope would enjoy the idea of Inquisition Update accusing the papacy of being a de facto government. <laughs> they probably wouldn't even bat an eye, but I make the charge. History records that the papacy is a de facto government. It's not a legitimate government. It is, in fact, the government, but it is unlawful. <laughs> the entire papacy rests on fraud and rebellion and had, given, and had been awarded its temporal crown under false pretenses. It is not a divine government. It is a de facto government and deserves to be overthrown according to the law of nations. So, when do we start, <laughs> is the question I'd like to ask. He says, if history were entirely silent upon the subject, this much might be inferred from the nature of the relations to each other, they being such as to create upon the part of each the reciprocal obligation to do anything the other should require. We're talking about this unholy alliance between the Pope and King Pepin. It said the Pope made Pepin a king. And why should not Pepin aid the Pope to break his allegiance to the Eastern emperors and become a king also? Whatever would justify the act of revolt in one case would equally justify it in the other. If the Pope had ecclesiastical authority sufficient to legalize the treason of Pepin against Childeric, the French legions had physical power enough to legalize the Pope's treason against his lawful sovereign, the King of Constantinople, the Emperor. You see how this works? <laughs> 
You see the de facto government in both Pepin and the Pope? It says, therefore, in this spirit of mutuality and in entire disregard of all legal rights, quote, the splendid donation was granted in supreme and absolute dominion, and the world beheld for the very first time a Christian bishop invested with the prerogatives of a temporal prince. Now you see the rise of the beast, the man of sin, the little horn, the son of perdition of Daniel and Paul being fulfilled in the papacy. Constantinople was no, no longer regarded. The, the, uh, that, uh, the Constantine and all his successors were in the east, and now God has erected a divine right ruler for the west. The little horn, the mouth that roars, that thinks to change times and laws. Here it is, fulfilled in history. And what does this do to the futurist interpretation of all these prophecies? That Christ won't come until the last seven years. And then the big argument it develops about, well, are you premillennial or are you pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib? It's all phony, and it's all created to cover up the historical and prophetic biblical fact that the man of sin shortly replaced Christ. Paul even warned about it. He said, he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. Paul was talking about an institution that existed in his time. He called it a he. He who now lets, he who now lets, will let until he be taken out of the way. That was Constantine. Okay, having some internet connection problems this morning. I don't know exactly when I got cut off. But it's, 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 it just cannot pass our interest if we are to suppose that the Pope has any divine sanction at all, why God waited seven and a half years for his vicar to take possession of any temporal authority on the earth? God did not want his people to be misled or deceived. This is not a divine institution. It makes absolutely no sense if the Pope is in any way a representative of Christ on earth to be his vicar and to rule the world as says the Pope in Christ's absence that Christ would wait seven and a half years, seven and a half centuries to elapse before the Pope became a king upon the earth. Now prior to this time, he was at best a bishop of Rome. And he was even in trouble with Constantine and his successors. Now he has led a de facto rebellion against the emperor with the help of another de facto government, Pepin, to gain his status as a temporal king. There is no unbiased mind who can look at history and call this a de jure government established by God. Uh, with anything near a divine right to rule the world, its basis is illegitimate, recorded by historians, and it is agreed... And why is this still a controversy? It should have been retired to the ash bin of history long ago. But the papacy has a prophetic role to play in the world, to be a counterfeit to the true kingdom of Christ. And closely looking at the papacy reveals that it is a poor counterfeit at best. Yet it deceives the whole world.
And what may we ask about the ecumenical Protestant churches, the evangelical churches, which I derisively refer to as ecumenical evangelibelly churches, churches that once acknowledged this fiction called the papacy as a fiction and denounced it as a fiction, as a usurpation, as a de facto government of the kingdom of Christ, and now seek to unite with this de facto government in Rome, this so-called replacement of the Son of God on earth, and in the name of peace and unity of the Christian world, no greater deception has ever been perpetrated on this country than Vatican Council II and the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation to destroy every vestige of Bible-believing Protestantism in this world. It's incomprehensible that the ecumenical movement has made such inroads to destroy the very understanding of what literally all of the Protestant reformers were unanimous about. That of all the institutions of the world, only the papacy fulfills every prophecy in the Bible regarding Antichrist. If the Protestant reformers could see what is happening in this country and around the world in this ecumenical movement and the popularity of Pope John Paul II and the statements made by Pope Benedict XVI, they would turn in their graves to see how the American people, the Protestants of, of, of America, have been deceived by the papacy is incomprehensible. The Pope and Pepin got together and overthrew their respective sovereigns and set up an institution that has deceived the whole world. And history so vividly exposes this usurpation I, it just still boggles my mind. It says, if history... Okay, we're still having technical problems with Internet congestion, I would assume. So we'll continue as best we can for the remainder of the program, and I'll listen to the recording of the program and find out what information I need to recover on tomorrow's broadcast. But the author continues, he says, If history were entirely silent upon the subject, this much might be inferred from the nature of their relations to each other, they being such as to create upon the part of each the reciprocal obligation to do anything that the other should require. The Pope made Pepin a king, and why should not Pepin aid the Pope in breaking his alliance, his allegiance to the Eastern emperors, and become a king also? Whatever would justify the act of revolt in one case would equally justify it in the other. If the Pope had ecclesiastical authority sufficient to legalize the treason of Pepin against Childeric, the French legions had physical power enough to legalize the Pope's treason against his lawful sovereign. Therefore, in this spirit of mutuality and entire disregard of all legal rights, quote, the splendid donation was granted in supreme and absolute dominion, and the world beheld for the first time a Christian bishop invested with the prerogatives of a temporal prince, seven and a half centuries after Christ. It is insisted by many who defend the temporal prerogatives of the popes that this donation of Pepin only restored to them jurisdiction which had been previously possessed. Even Archbishop Kenrick, in support of this assertion, has attempted, has been tempted, 
when speaking of the act of Pepin, incautiously to say, quote, This can scarcely be considered a mere donation, since a great portion, if not all, of the territory had already been had already belonged to the Pope. Whence Stephen the Fourth in the year seven sixty nine noticed the date when Stephen the Sixth in the year seven sixty nine urged the French princes Charles and Carloman as a matter of duty which they owed to Saint Peter to see that his property usurped by the Lombards should be restored. Unquote. The mind of the learned archbishop must have been somewhat confused when he wrote this. He first states as a matter of ownership of territory by the popes before the donation of Pepin in the year 754 during the pontificate of Stephen III, and to establish this cites the action and claim of Pope Stephen IV in the year 769, 15 years afterward this is either this is neither logical nor satisfactory but the important question at last is whether or no the statement of fact is to be relied on it is difficult if not impossible to reconcile it with the historical narrative if indeed it is not positively contradicted and it is positively contradicted in history there is no jurisdiction, temporal or spiritual, for the Pope of Rome. It is a human invention, and it must be renounced and recognized for what it is and condemned as a false Christ. I'll see you tomorrow. On